friends, and welcome to another episode of Studio Dialogues. My today's guest is the well-known watercolorist, Milan Malik. He's been painting for the last 35 years and is popularly known as a watercolor teacher through his workshops and many books on the subject. There can hardly be a watercolorist in India who has not read his books or you know, started off their journey being influenced by his style and his body of work. He's got numerous shows to his name and his work is in private collections around the world. Um, I'd like to describe his paintings as a symphony of composition, color, tones, patterns, and just joy. So let's get talking with Milanji. Good evening, Milan, sir. Uh, lovely to see you. Yeah, thank you for taking our time and I really appreciate it. Thank you. So Milan, sir, I think uh, obviously you don't need any introduction to anyone, but there's a memory I want to share with you. Uh, in 2015 or 14, you had a workshop in Humpy. And oh, at yeah. that time, I had not really worked with watercolors. I used to do more of oils, acrylics. Right. And uh, I just, uh, because a friend said, and you know, on a whim, I joined that workshop. Okay. Um, yeah, it was, I would say, a turning point for me <laughs> watching you paint. Because I don't know, I just saw the magic on paper. And uh, for me, that was love with watercolors. <laughs> so, oh, okay. so really, my journey started with watercolors in your workshop. Oh, great. Is, so, yeah. So, it's like a, I mean, a big thank you to you for that. Because uh, since then, I haven't really looked back at anything. Okay. You know, else. Okay. Um, so, I want to really start, uh, Milinsa, with your, uh, uh, we know your background, of course. We know that, you know, uh, you have an art background from childhood. But it'll be nice to hear your perspective on it and how it was growing up with a father who was a famous illustrator. So any, any your perspective, like how you saw the whole thing? No, for me, it was like uh, there was no big deal. My father was a painter. So uh, I started drawing at the age of uh, much early, like before I started actually writing. So for me, drawing was like uh, any other activity. And then I when when I went to school, then I realized that okay, everybody is not drawing uh, that good. So then I thought that drawing is uh, something odd. Okay, yeah, if you are able to draw, you are not part of the uh, herd, right? So um, when I used to be at home, I used to draw pretty well. But if I go to school, I used to make an effort to draw like the other boys. Hmm. I, see, I see, I <laughs> see. Uh, yeah, because, uh, because there was a competition or something. And the teacher asked, uh, ki, draw something and bring it. So I went home and, uh, no, it was some, I think, uh, in third or fourth standard, like some Gandhi Jayanti or something. And then I had a, a reference or something I don't remember I draw drew a picture and took it to my teacher and he said oh no you have to draw it yourself you can't ask your parents to draw it and bring it to me. <laughs> then I realized that this is not accepted in school then I but uh, yeah so that was <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an interesting story yeah. nice nice yeah, because I think uh, some of us, like for instance, I would say I really loved art as a kid, but having no artist around, had all the science and uh, IITians around me who mm. could not imagine me doing arts. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, I often feel that our school systems and our educational systems don't obviously uh, cater to art per se as a, as a big subject. So. Uh, you know, it'll be very interesting to um, uh, understand how, what's your perspective on how we can change that because, uh, uh, you know, nowadays arts can offer you a lot many more career opportunities. Right? Yeah, yeah. But actually those who like art, they can uh, find their own way. It's not that everybody should learn art. And, uh, okay. But it can be taught as uh, any other subject. See, my in my case, what happened, I... After my schooling, I went to 11, 12, I got good marks. So in my school, I never used to like the subjects like uh, language, mm -hmm. history and geography. I liked uh, mathematics and science in the school. Uh, then I went to science stream. Okay. Uh, after uh, getting good marks in 12th, I went to engineering. And uh, in, uh, 
in college education the i didn't have to study language or history or geography and then i started liking those subjects which mm -hmm. were not compelled for me to study i was painting all the time i was learning music also to, to an extent so any subject that was not offered in school i started liking that subject mm -hmm. and once i went to engineering i disliked all the engineering subject and i liked the art so if you want somebody to like the art cut it off from their uh, education system okay that is my view <laughs> mm. that's an interesting view yeah. so anything that is compelled for you to learn uh, becomes a compulsion and you entirely lose the fun of it interesting yeah because what you're saying is making sense in a different way because we all this i that... i uh, i mean my case was very similar to oscar wilde's quote like i don't let my education i don't let my schooling interfere with my education so whatever i learned was outside school outside college so if you want to make somebody like something deprive him of that hmm. but do you think you were deprived of art at home no no deprive I, I okay i i use the wrong word not deprive him of all that Uh, do not make it as a compulsion or anything. Okay. So, so basically, when you're made to do something, you really don't pay attention mm -hmm. to it. And you know, if you otherwise are interested, you will find your way. But I yeah. found that uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you, not in school or as a school subject. But there, there could be some way of um, uh, guiding people who really are interested. Yeah, in actually, actually, because I don't know about it. Uh, fortunately, I had the whole uh, access to yeah. because of my father. so people who don't have an access uh, i don't know about what happens with them uh, no? see basically uh, i mean lot of people are doing effort on that there is a friend of mine called uh, madhavi mehendra from pune like she is a, she is not a she is not running the school but she is one of the trustees running the school yes. so she is trying to make a effort to create an art wall where she is uh, displaying art of van gogh monet mane and including myself of the indian artist foreign artist so generally the boys will while they are walking through the corridor they look at the paintings so some of them are curious mm -hmm. then if you are curious then there is more information available so you have to uh, very subtly uh, put a, put forth the um, conditioning mm -hmm. uh, if you try to condition them in a intellectual or any other way then that's of no use so it is basically they have to have a uh, i mean all children have a uh, absolute biological response hmm. to any aesthetic yeah okay so you have to nurture that properly so i think more exposure to just art in general as as something as yeah an like music as like an... music you don't have to have music in the school those boys who because we all listen to music since the childhood then we pick up or we don't pick up right ah uh, yeah okay so um, i mean uh, milan sir for you what is really art i mean is it is it something that you just did naturally uh, with time and you it is is part of your life as a career or do you have a deeper sense of you know art means something more to you it means different things to different people no it is uh, for me it is almost like a obsessive uh, compulsive not i won't call it disorder but yeah obsessive compulsion so it is my hobby it is my profession and uh, yeah it's like my everyday routine so i don't have a very special uh, something but uh, something that i can't do without yeah okay but if you uh, uh, nobody has offered me but if somebody offers me some 100 crore rupees and ask me not to paint henceforth ever after hmm. uh i don't know what will i do at that point i will refuse it or i'll take it i'm not sure <laughs> well <laughs> I'm giving you an idea if you want to do that <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> interesting so sir so, um, one uh, you, you want me to elaborate the oscar wilde quote yes yeah, sure of course so um i want to go further like i don't let my schooling interfere with my education and i don't let my education interfere with my knowledge okay 
and i don't let my knowledge interfere with my wisdom <laughs> and neither do i let my wisdom interfere with my action and i don't let my actions interfere with my life <laughs> so this is now going to be a famous <laughs> milin valen <Malink> quote <laughs> So I'm curious to know, Melinda, uh, who are the um, maybe the world masters or uh, artists who inspired you while growing up? I mean, I know you've been painting for like say three or four decades now. So yeah. obviously those might have uh, changed yeah, or yeah. evolved. Yeah. So interesting. It'll be lovely to know, where, you know, what the, you want yeah. to. When I was in school uh, time or uh, during school and college, obviously my father was one of the biggest influence. Uh, he was doing. lot of comic illustration as well as he was painting uh, historical subjects etc then another uh, my father's contemporary he was a very good friend uh, ravi paranjpe mm -hmm. ravi paranjpe but you might say it paranjpe uh, in the national language he was also a very 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 big influence on what i am today and another watercolor painter called shivaji tupe whom i met and painted with i had the fortune of meeting him uh, he also so my father ravi pran speshi was to pay our three biggest influences direct influences and indirectly there were some artists from kolhapur who had actually uh, i met them but in a very old age like they mm -hmm. like ganpatra vadangekar and hardankar if you have heard of and one mr k b kulkarni i had i met him only once or twice i didn't have a, a big chance of uh, and uh, john fernandez was k b kulkarni's uh, disciple so i had the fortune of uh, meeting john fernandez and being at his uh, demonstration uh, he was not very senior but obviously he was like a uh, big brother uh, so these were the indian artists who influenced me directly and indirectly in the in those days and uh, non indian artist uh, like there are hundreds uh, like my father had collected lot of uh, british art artist magazine the magazine is called as the artist or something i don't know there is one american and one british so in that uh, there were so many uh, so many watercolor painters uh, so i think the watercolor tradition was uh, quite blooming that time uh in england okay before before it went to australia probably and now it's all over okay. so edward wesson edward siego then uh, right from many other i don't remember the name but uh, something like claud buckle jack marriott and uh, so they were uh, my favorite watercolor painter also along with that uh, artists like bernard dunston and ken howard Who, who were featured in the artist magazine they were oil, oil painters but largely my conditioning happened with uh, so one of my favorite painter i can say even today the top favorite is bernard dunston mm. many of you might not know him at all and from america then it's uh, like uh, john singer sergeant of course i knew then also winslow homer and andrew white andrew white was one of the uh i won't say influence but yeah something like andrew white uh, just uh, just uh, what makes you very unhappy okay uh very unhappy in the sense the kind of quality he has achieved uh you obviously compare what you are doing and what andrew white has done so andrew white was like a kick ass you can say <laughs> and so <laughs> bernard dunston yeah so andrew white and bernard dunston are still till date my most favorite mm -hmm. uh, i can't call influences but the inspiration i would say yeah yeah super yeah because mm -hmm. i i mean i have obviously you know i've been trying to uh, see the masters from the 17th and the 18th century uh, english uh, painters because they are quite inspiring with the way they used watercolor and how watercolor evolved because i was reading a book on the history of watercolor yeah, actually, uh, what the way we paint today is uh, john singer sargent uh, more impressionistic way absolutely uh, because turner and cotman uh, they were more more of a layering kind of a technique yeah. uh, their strokes also very oil painterly i mean 
Uh, no, they were small strokes and they were layering a lot of watercolor, so glazing. But a more impressionistic and spontaneous way came from uh, Sargent, I think, yeah. uh, and Homer uh, to an extent. I see. And Edward Wesson was much later. Edward Seagull was after, obviously, after a little after Sargent. Mm -hmm. But there, uh, so what we are following today is uh, Sergeant Sigo, a kind of a style. So John Yardley, uh, who is still there, uh, who is probably a disciple of Edward Wesson. And then, of course, after the internet came, there were a whole bunch of artists uh, that were doing good work. So every artist is an influence in one way or the other. Yeah. Any favorites uh, currently, I mean, uh, maybe living legends or whose work you think is really uh, maybe a par excellence or inspiring, you know, or Today? maybe the Today. beginners who are watching this the, can also dead, study their work. Dead artist or the living artist you're talking um, and I mean, <laughs> both is fine. But what I meant to say was more current. So whose work is more current, maybe? More current. So Last 50 years, 50 years. Other than me. Other than me. You, other, were. you are here already. You are the biggest inspiration for us. Yeah, I think. Other uh, than you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those three, three, four favorite artists, very popular artists are great. Like hmm. Joseph and Alvaro and Cheng Chung Vi is very nice. Yeah. But a lot of people haven't seen the Ping Long. Mm -hmm. Long is probably a little senior too, and Cheng Chung we I think is quite influenced by Ping Long. And there is another favorite artist of mine, Arush Watsmush. I don't know his real name is something different, but he I calls see. him to Arush Watsmush. Okay. He's a Russian fellow. A lot of Chinese stuff is good. I mean, yeah, great, great painter. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I think you, I mean, we all know that you also paint a lot in other mediums, like acrylics and oil, you have done a lot and you still yeah, I think, I paint a lot, lot of oil uh, long back, like yeah. uh, 95 I did an exhibition which was most of the oil paints and not as many watercolors. And, uh, but then later on what happened, like painting in oil became little uncomfortable, like too much of paraphernalia, then you washing those brushes and everything like uh, so i can uh, i can emphasize uh, that somebody impatient like me so i started doing what i started liking watercolor because of its comfort level right but uh, if you ask me the common question that uh, people common misconception people think watercolor is my most favorite medium no all are my equally favorite medium i see okay uh, i do watercolor because it suits my temperament Right. I was going to ask you that I know that you also enjoy doing acrylics at least. I know about acrylics a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, in uh, 95, if you ask me, uh, I had done an exhibition in oil and watercolors also. Later on, I started doing more watercolors. That time, people used to stay and people in the sense senior who were there, uh, a little senior than me. They said that if you want to be in the mainstream of hmm. exhibition and selling artwork, I wasn't doing that. I was never in the mainstream. Uh, I was doing some commercial work for my bread. Uh, but they said, if you want to be in the mainstream, you have to keep uh, doing oil acrylics because watercolor will extinguish was their um, notion. But I kept doing it. Then I published my book in 2000. Fortunately, my publisher was had the faith in me. And then later on today, if you see the watercolor bounce back and become the most popular medium all over the world. So. Um, it turned out like fortunately I I was doing watercolor and then watercolor got popularized all over the world. So, yeah. so talking about your books, Milan, sir, uh, there's one book which I uh, uh, really liked, natural, I mean I like a lot of them. I, hmm. I loved your book on perspective. Your, your latest book is A Journey that you... Uh, How many have you about. seen? Yeah. I have uh, four of your books. The rest, one or two, I've read uh, from someone else. But yeah, totally. I have, I have thirteen books, um, by the way, totally. You have thirteen books, Milan, sir. I thought, yeah. oh, okay. Then I've missed quite a few. So there is one though which I picked up uh, last year called uh, Natural Inspiration. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I really loved that book because uh, to me it was visual and linguistic poetry. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to know how it came about and what were your thoughts? I mean, how did you come about that book? The natural inspiration was basically uh, more than natural. It was a musical inspiration. Oh, okay. I see. The reason we called it natural inspiration because the paintings are uh, completely sans uh, human element. Hmm. Okay. There is no building. There is no human figure. There is uh, nothing of the human structure is there. There are only trees and leaves and uh, shapes and abstraction from the nature. Okay. Obviously, I've been doing landscape, so natural inspiration was one of the visual element in my mind all the time. Uh, so in the book also I have explained like the whole uh, journey started with uh, music. So we used to have this kind of a uh, event I would say we called it open canvas. Uh, the event was called open canvas like a uh, few musicians get together uh, not to play something uh, not to perform a gig or something but just to play something have a jam. Okay. So that uh, kind of music was more of an improvisational and free-flowing nature. And I used to play guitar also, so I was also part of uh, that. And then few artists will get together at the same time. And both the activities will have simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to see uh, if uh, both influence each other. Okay. So I was fortunately the only one who was doing both. Yeah, I used to paint for a while and go and play guitar for a while. So then I realized that uh, there is a different uh, um, experience I got through that. Um, one of the major uh, uh, benefit I can say, see, when we paint, uh, we just go on painting and painting in the studio. We're painting every day. So because of painting every day, what happens is your skill level goes on improving mm-hmm. and improving. So a very high skill level. But the flip side of a very high skill level is like uh, we fall into certain kind of habits yes. because the motor memory gets developed and uh, some kind of a repetitive patterns do get developed mm-hmm. in the uh, in brain also. So like if I have a, my palette set and my set of colors and set of uh, everything is like I'm in a most comfortable zone. So I would paint a, uh, a nice painting. But if I want to experiment something, it's not very easy. Because the mm-hmm. motor memory does not let uh, your creative imagination ride over. Okay. The motor memory always rides over. So to break it, you have to do some kind of experimentation. Okay. Then uh, uh, I was trying some abstract expressionism, some distorted uh, uh, whatever uh, isms. Okay. As an experiment to break from my okay. uh, motor memory development. To be more creative but those are like uh, kind of contrived experiments yeah when there is a music happening now it is very easy for me to break out of that habit some new kind of colors will uh, easily be picked up some new shapes will happen new splashes will come so because my ears i have uh, surrendered to the music you can say and somewhere that helped me break my habit so that was that was a great uh, euphoric moment, uh, and that, that's where the natural inspiration series started. So mm-hmm. then I did this experiment. Actually, I performed with uh, many of the uh, performing artists, like classical musicians, jazz musicians, on the stage. I painted along with them, nice. and uh, yeah. So I have done these kind of things with uh, uh, many musicians. Very interesting because music also I think um, unlocks parts of the brains with, which otherwise you know one is not using. So maybe it's you know doing uh, that function of uh, taking you to another. Yeah. Well, actually, the visual imagery uh, mm-hmm. and the musical. So uh, when I was speaking to another friend of mine and very senior musician, uh, Mrs. Arti Anklikar, if you heard of Arti Anklikar, she's a very senior, very renowned. Uh, uh, classical singer. So generally in the discussion uh, we were doing like uh, when they they render a classical uh, music piece, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. raga. So they are developing the rag. So it is like the improvisation. 
okay they are composing and singing at the same time so they are developing the rag so they have some kind of visual imagery which keeps on happening in front of their eyes and what a musician does is he is uh, filling up a timeline and we painters we are filling up the space mm. so it's a, some kind of a space time relation that we are trying to explore here um so there are a lot of parallel which go between that so when i listen to music immediately if i close my eyes some forms uh, colors and shapes will come in front of my eyes and uh, the musician also say that when they see something visually their musical rendition is affected by what they are looking at i see uh, lately meaning for last many years though but we've seen huh. a bit of abstraction in your work happening slowly i can see that you know the degree of abstraction was that from this exercise or uh, uh, was it independent no, no. i used to i mean i used to paint uh, and experiment in abstract expressionism right from day one i see okay i might not have exhibited that i didn't show it then but i was i used to experiment in uh, so um, it's not new it's, it's uh, i mean recently i exhibited more of my abstracts I so see. so realism and abstraction i don't think there is any difference as far as the artist is concerned uh, for me it is a color shape tone and the relation between shapes colors and tone and i'm trying to find the aesthetic between that so a house is just a triangle for me a mountain is a shape for me so and when i'm painting abstract for a viewer there is no objective identification when i'm painting realistic for a viewer there is a objective identification hmm. so for me there is no difference between hmm. that's interesting hmm. you're seeing both the same i mean it's shape yeah. right shape color tone <laughs> In fact, um, I had a question on this, which is uh, very uh, I thought interesting. Uh, you know, you have used many symbols in your um, in your work. You know, like and you've talked about it somewhere. I remember, in, either in a book or in some interview that I watched. Um, that um, you know, when you paint uh, uh, with symbols like say animals or bicycles, which is I think one of your fav- like one of your mm-hmm. few favorites, uh, humans, boats, anything. Yeah. Um, you know, these are really iconic in your paintings because we, we, you know, we know it's a, it's your painting when we see a certain style of these symbols being used, like your palm tree, for instance, it's very distinct. Uh, yeah. So a bicycle or a rickshaw would be very incidentally, uh, the part of the scene I was painting hmm. and, uh, maybe there are a few other things, but that cycle become very dominantly. Uh, important uh, which almost acted like a protagonist in that picture exactly so okay. what i feel is that they tell a story so you use them to sto- tell stories yeah right? yeah i didn't know that to tell a story it happened that uh, the cycle being there yeah. this became a sto- the major storytelling element which was uh, which just happened so it was not a conscious decision i see but subconsciously obviously this without the cycle the painting wouldn't be a complete thing right right so that cycle being there was very important part of uh, mm. completing and that itself uh, became a protagonist so there is always the storytelling element in the painting don't think that it has to be a human being or a cycle or mm. uh, something mm. uh, see uh, there's something called as uh, i mean have you seen my book called as watercolor expression yes so there is a chapter called as vision vision is this mm-hmm. vision i mean what i mean is like when you're painting obviously your drawing is correct your technique is correct your composition is balanced tones are balanced and everything is uh, as far as the visual elements are concerned you are through with everything but the painting has to have something more than that mm-hmm. which if you define it as vision then the storytelling comes into place uh the mood comes into place when we are doing a landscape painting a lot of the atmospheric uh, mood that comes into play or some kind of abstraction which uh, takes uh, the painting from a uh, away from the documentation and take it toward more towards the poetic uh, expression hmm. so these are the elements which uh, i defined as a vision in a painting so if i if somebody asks me to be a judge uh in a competition which i never uh, do but uh, 
then I would look for vision. Decide mm -hmm. a good painting and a bad painting. Good and a first or the second. Uh, I see. So vision be... for you is that important? Ha, vision for me, it is quite important. So that vision is not necessarily the storytelling by the protagonist. It can be atmospheric uh, feeling. It can be some kind of abstraction level, which is giving uh, something more. So there are various ways or which can be some social messaging also, which I don't believe much in through painting. If you want to give a social message, go and do it on the street. Don't paint the fuck. <laughs> uh, no, that's side tracking. Uh, but you know what I mean, that uh, vision uh, can't be defined by one particular thing, but that is the important part of uh, painting. But often, sir, um, a lot of people, I mean, artists express social, you know, uh, maybe issues or something through art. I mean, uh, what's your view on that? I mean, you don't believe in that or you feel... No, uh, art, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to express, uh, you can express it through whatever. You can write about it. You can mm -hmm. express it. I think writing is better, like, so that it's a direct social message you are giving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this. I don't like this. It should be like this. It shouldn't be like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, why why are you spending your art to do that okay <laughs> keep your art as a uh, much more expression i mean uh, it need not be like uh, only beautiful art or something mm -hmm. I, I don't say that mm -hmm. but let it be your expression without any messaging if you want to give a social message go on the street and give it or write about it that would be a better idea i don't believe in social messaging yes. through art I don't see the necessity of it. Mm. And uh, as they say, one one visual can convey 100 words or something. Uh, I don't know who, what's that bullshit. So, sir, sir, I wanted to ask you one more thing. Uh, you're very famous for saying something. Uh, whenever we youngsters used to ask you for <laughs> which paper are you using and which brush yeah, and yeah. long back. Uh, when when <laughs> you say we youngsters, are you putting me in a... Uh, no, so I'm you, saying art uh, youngsters. I don't age. <laughs> okay, okay. My art journey is not 30 years. It's okay, fine, you know, fine. Eight years or so. So, okay. um, uh, you know, so whenever we would do that, you know, you would say shut up and paint. That's what you tell your students, right? Yeah, shut up yeah, and paint. Yeah. And it'll be so lovely to hear, you know, more about that uh, for people who are going to be watching this. That's, that's not my original phrase. I read it somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, there, there is an artist called Robert Ginn, if you know. Robert mm -hmm. Ginn to write a lot of blogs. I mean, he, he's yeah. no more there, but his blogs are still there, called mm -hmm. Painter Keys. So, uh, I read about this Shut Up and Paint idea on that blog, and then uh, I liked it so much that I started using it. Right. And I've been hearing about it uh, since. See, Shut Up and Paint actually originated more in a literary word. So, uh, the thing is, if a writer thinks of a story, mm -hmm. He has thought of a story. Okay, so it's a very virgin idea of a story in his mind. And before writing, he he thinks that I'll tell, share this with my wife or share it with my friend and ask them how's it. If he does that, <laughs> when he actually starts to write it, no. he said, Yeah, I've already told it. So that uh, sharpness of the expression goes away. That's why I just hold it, shut up and write it. So, I, I that. in that sense, it's actually shut up and paint. If you want to do a painting, do not ever talk about what you're going to paint. Do it. Okay. Then also it has a, um, added, a meaning, added meaning in this and added message to it. Like a lot of students talk a lot about art and they want to know verbally. So, you have to tell them just shut up and paint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, if you go, it is actually uh, a message to oneself that if uh, while painting, if we can shut ourselves up mm -hmm. from inside, uh, better results are seen, which is impossible. I mean, we can't shut up ourselves in our brain, but that is the idea ideal uh... no but i understand what you're saying because there are times when uh, the mind goes into a zone and you do mm -hmm. produce something which you didn't think you could and uh, that happens only when you go into that particular zone yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's something which is almost i wouldn't call it meditation i used to earlier but i don't think this is equal oh, to, I used to art is not meditation 
<laughs> uh, no, I used to like the word called as uh, effortless ease. Hmm. So sometimes you produce something uh, with very effortless ease and you are 100% happy with it. Yes. And it it happens only uh, very few times. Yeah. Because once it happens, then you try to repeat that experience and then <laughs> the whole thing goes. It never happens again. I, I yeah. know that. <laughs> See, I don't know about meditation, but one good thing about art is like, uh, if you are in a good mood, you can paint. Uh, if you are in a bad mood, if you paint, yeah, your mood changes. Uh, because uh, you are using your right side. So it compares to um, what suppress your left side. So generally it helps in relaxation. So sir, just one uh, related question to this. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, are very focused on just creating paintings, paintings. I think a lot of uh, people who have painted for a lot of years believe in a lot of play experimentation because when you are learning anything, you experiment, even with music, for instance, you, you just practice and practice and you, mm. you, know, you try out, you improvise, like you said. Mm. So uh, in, when it comes to watercolor specifically, uh, how much, you know, for as a professional artist, how much should one, how should one balance that? Because you need to produce also if you're a professional artist, but how do you train yourself to not get stuck in a rut, to break free? Like you said, improvise, uh, get out of the motor, you know, loop and uh, keep, you know, growing in that sense, not just in skills, but in also your thinking and, you know, what you actually paint in. See, being a professional artist, it's a little tricky, sad situation. Uh, like uh, if, you are, if your daily bread is supported by this thing, you have to do something which is uh, required in the market. Yeah. So largely, I think most of the watercolor painters are also watercolor teachers. So they are making their bread out of uh, teaching uh, workshops and YouTube videos and something like that. So selling of art doesn't become a compulsion. Um, so I don't know. It's very difficult for any artist to actually not think of uh, the society and do something of his own. Hmm. Uh, that's not very easy. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, that is a... Uh, main question I had about uh, when you have to make a career out of art, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky situation. Uh, yeah, you can teach, you can sell some of your art, but selling your art is not easy. And uh, yeah, and the selling of selling art is a, has a uh, immediate uh, what you can say a backlash. Now, mm -hmm. uh, if you start selling your art, uh, maybe you are making good money out of it, but mm -hmm. then when you are producing the next piece you are thinking of the sold pieces and trying to reproduce something which will get sold. Mm -hmm. So which itself is a, a not happy situation for mm -hmm. a fine artist. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of artists keep on repeating. Uh, so then, then it doesn't remain to be a fine art. No? Then it becomes a kind of commercial art because you know what is selling and you're producing what is selling. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that's fine. That's fine. I, I have no, I think for someone who has to make their bread and butter uh, through this yeah. as a career, I mean, uh, I really don't see that as a negative. Uh, it's about yeah. doing both. I personally yeah. feel that you need to do both because mm. I think if we just do it, do things for bread and butter, it's no more a passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So that's the balance I think everybody has to find in their life. Yeah, so every, every artist, I mean, every artist in the sense, uh, a musician, a painter, yeah. or a movie maker, everybody has to find a balance between their commercial activity and uh, non-commercial activity. Mm -hmm. Only fortunate people like, uh, I don't know, uh, I would say like Van Gogh never cared about selling his art, but now the world is, uh, his paintings are being sold. So he didn't care about selling. Um, probably Picasso and those famous ones, they did whatever they did got sold. So they were fortunate. So probably he, they also didn't have the, uh, or like MF Hussein, he doesn't have to think what will sell, whatever he does gets sold. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what's his psyche, but uh, that's a, that's something every artist wants. He, yeah. otherwise, if I'm doing an exhibition, I'm thinking of how many people will like this painting, which kind of paintings will get sold. And uh, that's not a very happy situation. Okay. Very few 
have the luck to get out of that. Milan sir, uh, then I have this uh, desire mm. to one day see the world with your eyes. <laughs> because to me as an artist, things have changed. Like since I started uh, thinking about more of art and uh, I, obviously, and we start seeing things in shapes and it's no more, a, like you said, a hut is no more just a hut. It becomes, yeah. uh, you know, a medley of shapes and angles right, and right. Uh, colors and shadows for, yeah. for me. Like. So, uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I this, this is just a comment, it's not a question. But I have this desire to see the world from your eyes because I know it will look different. stopping you. <laughs> How, you know, I'll have to hypnotize you and then... <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, right. see the world from your eyes. But yeah, I mean, we get to see when you see you paint live and paint in front of us. It's it's. Oh, have you seen this uh, movie called uh, Beautiful Mind? Yes, of course. Russell Crowe. Yes. So he's a mathematician, and he used to find patterns and everything, mm -hmm. uh, the mathematical equation pattern. So like there are flock of birds uh, flying. So he would immediately try to get an equation out of uh, how whatever the non-linear dynamics. So, so that's a, a similar situation happens with us. Like uh, whenever I'm sitting in a, say, coffee shop talking to somebody and suddenly the brain gets into pattern uh, finding mode. Hmm. So I'm seeing that there is a red band on this coffee cup. Then there is a red strip going there. Then some red square over there and somebody sitting with a red. So that red goes bouncing. Then the black is connected and the blues are there. So those kind of uh, pattern recognition things keep on happening. And sometimes you lose the sense of reality. So mm. somebody is talking to you, but you're not actually listening <laughs> to him. You are finding patterns outside. So, so uh, not in a negative sense, but it's a very similar uh, thing that they have shown, actually shown. When I saw mm. the movie, then I realized that if it becomes too much, we might get into um, schizophrenic mode. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I already reasonably obsessed with what we do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit more. I think uh, we can talk forever. I at least can listen to you forever. But uh, at some point, I want to also don't take up too much of your time. But I'd like to uh, end with uh, knowing a bit more about what I know. You, you love music. I've heard you play. It's amazing music. You're an amazing musician also. Uh, what else, you know, uh, maybe you can share your favorite type of music, is it jazz or classical? Uh, no, I, I like uh, all types of music. Like I used to play rock and roll. That's why I, uh, I play more of a guitar, uh, more of a guitar and mainstream rock and roll stuff of the 70s, 80s. But I like all the new generation, uh, uh, what you can say. Uh, I don't know how to define that music, but they are more of more of a jazz uh, fusion hmm. kind of stuff they are doing out there. And I I like classical music also, Indian classical. I haven't heard Western classical to that extent, okay. but more of a melodic nature music I like more. Hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean I like Hindi songs as much. I like Marathi songs as much. So light music, classical music, jazz, rock and roll, and uh, these uh, new age experiments people are doing. Fusion, fusion uh, kind of yeah. stuff. Okay. And I mean, anything else you'd like to share about your life or your family or, uh, you know, you like to travel? What are the other things you like to do apart from painting and music? Apart I know that must be taking a lot of your chunk of your time, but... No, largely apart from painting and music, I spend my time sleeping <laughs> on <laughs> passive entertainment, which is like uh, movies. Right. And I used to read a lot earlier, but now I'm not reading much because of, uh, I don't know, my time span has just reduced of mm -hmm. reading. No, since the time the glasses came over, my reading just reduced. And uh, yeah, I I like movies and uh, what uh, Netflix serials I enjoy doing that and I spend a lot of time on watching YouTube uh, videos of musicians I and uh, also their interviews like like when I used to play music long time back in the 80s uh, there were great musicians whom whom we never saw we only mm -hmm. heard 
now through the YouTube, you get to see the background of them. There are some videos of them. Uh, so you find them on YouTube. So it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. And yeah, we get to know know the artists also now, not just mm -hmm. their work, which is interesting. A lot of, yeah, as far as the traveling is concerned, I don't like uh, the travel part of traveling. Okay. Uh, I mean, if I want to go to some place like Manali, mm -hmm. I want to be there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> traveling is killing. Uh, going to places is very interesting. So I'm waiting for the time when the virtual travel uh, possibilities will come, but I don't think they will come in. Right. While, yeah. Or the Harry Potter world comes in and we can travel by some yeah, magic. Yeah, can travel by some magic. <laughs> like. I would have loved to hear some of your, your guitaring, but I don't know if you are in the mood or you have a guitar with you. I don't know. Just if you have maybe. time, I can play a little bit. I mean, just oh, I just have all it. the time in the world. <laughs> so much uh, thank you so much for uh, this because yeah. for me this is not this these series are not complete unless you are there in it oh <laughs> and okay. i wish you good health and happiness same to you yes. thank you thank you bye okay thank you sir